Throughout the Lenten season, we have focused on the action of looking. We've looked up, we've looked around, we look where we've been, we've looked. Why? Why look? Looking helps us see where we are going, to know what is ahead, to keep us from turning in circles on the journey. And today we will be looking at what's next. It's good to know what is ahead down the road. I can put in and look at my destination on the map, but I have to know where's my next step from where I am right now. And so uh, this faith journey that we're on, we can't stay in the same place. We have to go and continue on working towards holiness, looking to the places that we need to grow and taking that next action to get there. Today in John's Gospel, we find a major transition point. This first part of John's Gospel spends time looking at seven signs or seven specific miracles in Jesus' ministry. The wedding feast at Cana, the healing of the royal official's son, this, this healing of a paralytic man in Bethsaida. Jesus feeds 5,000. He walks on the waters. He heals a man born blind. And then finally, the raising of Lazarus. Now, according to this final chapter in John's Gospel, and as we look at the other Gospels, Jesus did more than these seven. But these, are, these seven are highlighted in John's Gospel for a particular reason. Each of these miracles grow in their intensity and are the sign of more and more people beginning to see who Jesus really is, truly sent from God. In today's scripture, we see this turn from the signs of Jesus to something else. So let's hear uh, the words uh, from the Gospel John this morning uh, in chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor now, my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. May our thanks be to God. The word has gotten out. Past the small town of Nazareth, beyond the region of Galilee, out into the streets of Jerusalem, the holy city. Words traveled fast in those days. Maybe not as fast as Twitter, but that's probably a good thing. 
word had gotten out that Jesus had brought someone back to life. The Pharisees and the religious rulers knew this was the last straw. There was no way they were able to keep the crowds of people from hearing what Jesus had done to Lazarus. Sarcastically, they said, the whole world is going after him. And they could not have been more right. The Greeks had heard. These were outsiders. These Gentiles made their way trying to find Jesus to see if they too could follow him. It's a lot different than the way Jesus began his ministry. Where Jesus was the one to approach and say, follow me. Now the tides have turned. People have seen. They have heard. And now they're seeking to follow him. I mean, these were outsiders. These are Greeks. They're not locals. They're just in town for a short time. Tourists. Like folks from all across Georgia who have come to see the cherry blossom festival. But how is it that they knew to ask Philip? He was their main end, so, uh, so they said, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip was their go-to. You know, we have go-to people in our lives. For car talk, I call my buddy Brian. We work on cars together. I like to tinker. Um, and he's done a lot more work than I've ever tried or attempted on a car. And so when I get to that place of unfamiliarity, I go to him with any question that I have. Or if I need to know something about sports, I'm not a huge sports fan. I enjoy it. I like to go. But if I have questions, I call my buddy Kalen. He is a sports guru. He knows stats, who's going to play who, and what the likely outcome is going to be. Kalen is my go-to for sports. I mentioned earlier I like to bake. And so when I have a cooking question or a baking question, I call my friend Jennifer. She's a, 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 a food food, nutrition, and food science and nutrition teacher in her high school. She's my go-to gal with cooking. And we all have go-to people in our lives. Maybe for technology questions or book recommendations for any area of our lives. We might have a go-to person. But I wonder, I do wonder, what was it about Philip that made him the go-to person for these Greeks. Maybe there was something about the way he lived his life that was noticeable. The way he spoke to people about and, and, and to other people. Maybe the way he handled his business dealings, how he was willing to serve without the need for recognition. I don't know. I'm not sure uh, what it was about Philip the scripture doesn't really give us a whole lot of clues here to that answer. But I do think about, what I do think about is, is how someone like you or I could be that same sort of go-to person. So let's take a moment and, and reflect on our own lives. Are people asking us about Jesus? Think back over the last few months. When was the last time someone asked your opinion as a believer? Or maybe asked you to pray for them? Or asked you about Jesus himself? Sir, ma'am, we wish to see Jesus. They're asking. Now it might not be in these same exact words, but people may be asking. We could be known for a lot of different things, good things in fact, but what would it take for us to be known as the go-to men or women for Jesus? What if somehow the community around us saw something different about us as folks at Vineville? 
that if they were seeking Jesus or had questions about faith, they would think maybe one of us could help them. Our neighbors, our co-workers, our golf buddies, our classmates, anybody could ask. So what could we do to be more like Philip? So when people are looking for Jesus, when they want to talk about faith, they think of us. Sir, ma'am, we want to see Jesus. In a similar way, Greeks show up in our lives, outsiders, that is, even here at Bible. And I know it's, it's not uncommon for there to be a first-time visitor in worship here with us. And I think it's important that we think about that and be reminded from time to time that, that they've worked up the courage to come to a new place and visit. Very often, they, they may not know any of us here. And they come hoping to encounter Christ in worship and in this community. For those of us who are, are together every week, uh, the story of, of Greeks coming should be a reminder to reach out to those around us. Because we want to embrace those newcomers. We want, we want it viable to be uh, an easy place to visit. And maybe to go a step further, I want to uh, challenge you or commission you, all of you here, uh, to maybe take some responsibility uh, uh, to those around you. This is a big place. We have a lot of people spread out between three different services, and it's kind of hard for us to keep up uh, who's, who's been here, who's missing, who's sick. And so I want to commission you to challenge you to think about the people that you sit next with. And Jimmy has reminded us of this from time to time, but think about those people who sit maybe three rows in front of you and three rows back. They kind of take notice when they're here and when they're not uh, to take that next step and making sure they don't feel like an outsider. So if you miss them, call them. Check on them. If they're sick, let us know. If someone new sits in your section, introduce yourself. Don't wait for them to move, to come to you. Uh, uh, take the initiative. Find out who they are. Make sure they know uh, uh, as they are here, they too can see Jesus. Don't, don't wait for Greeks to come to you. Go to them and welcome them. And that's part of our responsibility as, as a member to care for our community. And when we do that well, when we do that well, people will indeed see Jesus. So, John's gospel shows the world uh, uh, that what Jesus has done, which, which, which has upset a lot of people and power, and suddenly there was this booming voice from heaven. God was speaking to them. And the crowd heard it too, but they didn't hear the same thing. Uh, some said it was thunder. Others said it might be an angel. But I think it's kind of strange uh, to to think about the voice of God, our Creator, and just dismiss it as noise. Almost as if the people had tuned out. It's kind of like the Charlie Brown comic when the teacher is talking and all the students hear is wah, 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 wah. To the crowd, these words which were actually for their sake, that they might benefit and yet what they hear is the wah, wah, wah. And it's, it means nothing to them. Blah, 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 or yada, yada, yada. However you want to name that phrase, they had tuned it out. One day an old farmer was persuaded by his nephew to, to visit the big city. The young man proudly took the farmer on tour of New York, seeing the sights skyscrapers, the traffic, the people everywhere. And as they walked down the street, the old man suddenly stopped and said, hey, did you hear that? The young man took, uh, looked at the sea of, of pedestrians, 
He looked at the traffic and he replied, hear what? The cricket. The old guy walked towards this little tuft of grass growing out of a crack next to a tall building and sure enough there tucked away in that crack was a cricket. The nephew was amazed. How could you pick up on that little sound of a cricket and all this noise? His uncle didn't say a word. He reached into his pocket, pulled out a few coins, threw them on the, on the sidewalk, and heads turned. People began to, to, to look because they had heard a familiar sound. We hear what our ears are trained to hear, he told his nephew. Psychologists say that, that many people are so preoccupied with their daily task that they rarely listen to those around them. We hear what our ears are trained to hear. God did speak to the people that day. But it's really important to know that God continues to speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's an inward voice, something in your mind, or this gut feeling. God even speaks to us through our friends. Maybe we've heard others say, well, I felt like God was telling me to go on the mission trip to Nicaragua. I've heard that before. I've heard someone say, uh, God really spoke to me and nudged me that I need to start helping teach children Sunday school. And I have no doubt that God speaks to us in these ways. But one way to make sure we're ready to hear God is to take regular time and silence. Mother Teresa put it this way. She says, we need to find God and, and God cannot be found in the noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. The more we receive in silent prayer, the more we can give in our active life. We need silence to be able to touch souls. And the essential thing is not what we say, but what God says to us and through us. So silence. That's how we can train ourselves to hear. And I want to encourage you, if you hear God speaking to you in any of these ways, to listen, to share it with others. Don't dismiss it as thunder. Some people don't hear God through all the noise in life. And then others hear and just refuse to listen. My dog, Winston, is a good example of that. We're at, at our house, we have a little doggy door, which, which is great because if Sarah and I are not around for the day, Winston can go out, stretch his legs, have a sun bath, and take care of business, whatever he needs to do. And it's great to have a dog door. But we've learned recently there's a new cat in the neighborhood. And Cats, well, they do like to annoy dogs to no end, especially when they feel safe. They like to walk by the fence and purr and grab his attention. And uh, Winston responds with a lot of loud, deep barking. I, I guess that's the part of the hound part of him. Uh, and uh, so he'll bark and bark. And it's not just like we hear it. It's our neighbors, and it's loud enough our neighbor's neighbors hear him barking and so what I do is I'll go outside I'll open the door and say Winston come here buddy come inside and I see him and I know he hears me because for a moment he stops his ears perk up and then he goes back to barking he starts running back and forth at the fence and he proceeds with the barking, and not until I tell Winston, hey, buddy, I've got a treat for you, come inside, will he turn around and come inside, and I can shut the dog door. He heard my first command to come, but he pretended he didn't. He'd rather bark and chase cats. Sometimes we might think that the best chance to keep life the way it is, comfortable, manageable at least, 
is to pretend that we did not hear God speaking to us. And I get it. Jesus' message to follow him, to lose your life, to go where he goes and be a servant is extremely hard. Certainly it isn't, it's not appealing at first glance. Sure, the people of Jesus' day wanted the Son of Man to be glorified. They wanted a new ruler, a Messiah that would make their world a better place. And victory was in the air. But Jesus went on to talk about what kind of service he expected. The kind of service that would glorify God, taking up one's cross or to lose one's life. Nobody wanted to hear that a long time ago. And it's still hard to get in that mindset today. It's risky. Like a hermit crab. They find a shell. They move in. They eat and grow. But they get to this point of transition. That they've gotten big enough to need another shell. And if they don't find another shell, they cease to grow and will eventually die. And there's a decision, a decision to move, and it's critical in the life of the hermit crab. They decide, if they decide to go to the other shell, they take a moment of risk where they move beyond the protection of the old shell as they're not yet into that new one. And so Jesus, in a way, is inviting us this morning to live a new life. Jesus is inviting this church to move from a haven of safety and refuge to risk movement and mission out into the world. Are you willing to move out your shell? Are you willing to risk following Jesus? Look at what's next. What needs changing in my life so that people, others, can ask me, about Christ? How can you or I be Philip for Macon, Georgia, our own family, or even our circle of friends? Look what's next and commit to to learning about those who are around you as a way to practice hospitality. Look at what's next, ready to follow Christ's own example of being in service even when it's risky because it's in those risky places Christ is with us. And when Christ is with us, we can be confident that there is no better life to be found anywhere else. Amen.